Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. I'm Corey Evan, coming up in The Weekender. More fallout comes to the surface in the Mediterranean as migrants continue to brave the waters in death traps. 3D printable guns still take aim in our continuing battle against global socialism. Today's Crime in Pinhead's lesson, how not to use pepper spray. In our game show news minute, Neil Patrick Harris is ready for what he calls the best time ever. And as the gents get ready for Mother's Day, I have some facts for you which will blow you away. So gents, call up your mothers, wish them a happy Mother's Day, and tell them to tune in to shrmedia.com right now. Because the weekend is starting now. Making sense of the week's news and most of your weekend from Southern California. This is the SHR Weekender with Corey Evans. And happy Mother's Day to all the mothers across the land. From the SHR Weekender, I'm Corey Evan, and I hope you're feeling loved no matter where you are. Hope you're feeling some sunshine in your life no matter where you are, even if it's not so sunny like here in Southern California. But never mind, let's get to the weekend news, starting with one from the Australian. Italian investigators say many bodies are on the wreck of a boat believed to be the craft that sank three weeks ago with more than 800 migrants on board. Prosecutor Giovanni Salvi made the announcement in Catania, Sicily, a day after the Italian Navy said it had located a 25-meter vessel about 100 miles northeast of the Libyan coast and 375 meters below sea level. The Navy captured images of the vessel, believed to be the migrant boat that sank on April 18th, using a remotely operated camera. Only 28 people survived that shipwreck, and 24 bodies were found floating at sea. Survivors reported that hundreds more people were on board, locked in the hold of the vessel, and unable to escape after it overturned. Salvi said footage indicated that at least one cabin door was open, and explained that prosecutors were considering the possibility of ordering the recovery of the wreck from the seabed to verify whether the doors were really locked. The UN's refugee agency described the shipwreck as the deadliest incident in the Mediterranean ever recorded. Stay with us here at SHR Media. We will keep you posted on the latest updates on the Mediterranean migrant situation as they become available. An army helicopter has crashed in a mountainous part of northern Pakistan, killing seven people, including the Philippine and Norwegian ambassadors. This from the BBC. It crashed during an emergency landing in the Gilgit-Baltistan territory. The wives of the Indonesian and Malaysian envoys, two pilots, and a crew member also died. They were to attend the opening of a tourism project. Two senior Pakistani ministers said the crash was down to a technical fault. Earlier, the Pakistani Taliban said they were behind the attack. But Defense Minister Kawaja Asif and Foreign Minister Aziz Chowdhury said there appeared to have been technical problems with the helicopter. This is one of the most tragic aviation disasters for the Pakistani military in decades. The last time one of its air crashes killed a foreign diplomat was in 1988, when a C-130 carrying then-military ruler Gen Zia-ul-Haq, U.S. Ambassador Arnold Rafael, and several of the Army top brass crashed in southern Pakistan, killing all on board. The diplomats flying in the ill-fated MI-17 on Friday were headed for the inauguration of a ski chairlift built in the breathtaking resort of Naltar in northern Pakistan. The 180-seat lift was donated by Switzerland and installed by the Pakistani Air Force. Its test run was completed in August, but its formal opening was delayed several times due to Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's preoccupations elsewhere. Yesterday, Mr. Sharif flew to within 25 miles of Naltar Valley, but just then the news of the crash came and he had to turn back without touching down at the regional airport in Gilgit. The area is not a stronghold of the Pakistani Taliban. The militant group earlier issued a statement saying they had shot down the helicopter with an anti-aircraft missile intending to kill the Prime Minister. Just north of the border, Walmart Canada is scooping up 13 former Target Canada stores and one distribution center in a $350 million expansion project. This according to the Globe and Mail. The retail behemoth said on Friday that it has struck agreements to acquire Target store leases, one owned property, and a distribution center for 165 mil. It plans to invest another 185 mil to renovate the 13 stores and distribution center. The locations are in British Columbia, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec, and the new stores and distribution center are expected to result in the creation of about 2,400 in-store jobs, 1,000 jobs in the center, 
and 1,500 construction jobs. Target Canada was granted court protection from its creditors in January after a failed attempt at penetrating the Canadian retail market. It said it was leaving Canada and closing all 133 of its stores and auctioning them off. Walmart Canada said on Friday that the proposed transactions are subject to approval from the court in accordance with proceedings under the company's Creditors Arrangement Act and certain other customary conditions. So far this year, Walmart Canada's total investment in new stores, expansion of its distribution network, and e-commerce projects comes to about 690 mil, according to the company. Another Canadian retailer cherry-picking former Target outlets is Canadian Tire Corporation. Montreal-based grocer Metro Inc. and Hudson's Bay have expressed interest in acquiring Target leases as well. Imagine that. Target misses the bullseye, and the rest of the country steps in and takes aim at the former locations of Zellers. For those of you who don't know what Zellers was, they were a retailer much like Kmart. But never mind, there are more pertinent matters back on domestic soil here in the U.S. This from the Houston Chronicle. When spring arrives in Oklahoma and conditions are ripe for tornadoes, David Wheeler and his family don't take any chances. Two years ago, a top-of-the-scale twister tore a miles-long path through this Oklahoma City suburb and turned Wheeler's son's school into a pile of rubble. That's when he installed a small underground shelter in his garage. Now the family regularly drills on what to do if the skies turn ominous. The Wheeler family retreated underground nearly a dozen times on Wednesday night when a powerful thunderstorm that rumbled across the southern plains produced more than 50 tornadoes. The menacing clouds had barely vanished before forecasters began warning of another system that could produce even more violent twisters through the weekend in parts of Kansas, Oklahoma, and North Texas. A few tornadoes touched down Friday night in Texas and Oklahoma, but no damage was reported. The main threat seemed to be flooding from heavy rains in Oklahoma. Officials closed some roads, including parts of Interstate 44 in Tulsa, and were telling residents in one neighborhood in Shawnee that a lake dam was close to being breached. The Plain states were not the only ones with threatening skies. Twin weather systems stretching from the Carolinas to California produced an unseasonably early tropical storm in the Atlantic and a late snowstorm in the Rocky Mountains. Snow was also possible in the Nebraska Panhandle, which could get up to 5 inches, and parts of South Dakota, which could receive as much as a foot, according to the National Weather Service. Lucky. Heavy rain that accompanied the last round of storms has swollen Oklahoma creeks and rivers, dramatically increasing the likelihood of flash flooding as the next round of storms approaches, this according to a weather service source. In fact, one deluge was so heavy that a 43-year-old Oklahoma City woman drowned after becoming trapped inside her underground storm cellar. So you can tell just how bad these storms are, and we will keep an eye on these storms and bring you the latest on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash shrweekender. And here's an interesting one from the Christian Science Monitor, which will make you think about how you use 911 in a situation. A Central Florida woman helped save herself and her children by sending a message in an online pizza order that asked employees to call 911 because she was being held hostage. Very smart. The Avon Park, Florida Pizza Hut employees spotted what Cheryl Treadway wrote in the comments section of her online order. Employees recognized Treadway as a regular customer and called the sheriff's office. Highlands County Sheriff's deputies went to the home where they were greeted by Treadway, who was carrying a small child. She told them her boyfriend, Ethan Nickerson, was inside the home, armed with a knife. Her other two children were also inside. Treadway and the child were escorted to safety. WFLA-TV reports Lieutenant Curtis Ludden started talking to Nickerson through a closed door. It took about 20 minutes for Ludden to talk Nickerson into coming out peacefully. The children, thankfully, were not harmed. According to an arrest report, the couple had been arguing throughout the day, and Nickerson carried a knife. When Treadway started to leave to pick up her kids from school, Nickerson grabbed her and took her phone away. He went with her to the school. Deputies say she eventually talked Nickerson into letting her use the phone and order a pizza, but immediately after sending the request, Nickerson took the phone back. Nickerson was arrested and now faces multiple charges, including aggravated assault with a weapon, without intent to kill, battery, and false imprisonment. His bail has been set at 45 grand in the Highlands County Jail. Jail records didn't indicate whether he has hired an attorney, but I hope he does soon because when you get busted through Pizza Hut, you know that your crime was going to fall apart very quickly. Come to think of it, it's not the only time that someone's used ordering a pizza as an excuse to call the police. This report also details a report of someone calling 911 and pretending to order a At first, that 911 dispatcher didn't know what was going on. He thought it was probably a prank call. But then he realized they can't actually say that they're in an emergency. So he caught on. Very smart. 
In fact, I'm going to post that one up on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash SHR Weekender. Check it out. And now I've got three good ones to report in our continuing battle against global, global socialism. socialism. First up from Mashable.com, Apple could have a hand in helping researchers learn more about your DNA. The company's reportedly planning to work with scientists to collect DNA for genetic research as part of its research kit platform. As outlined in MIT Technologies Review, Apple has two studies planned, one with the University of California, San Francisco, and the other with Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, that would allow the partners to collect or test DNA via an iPhone app. Apple announced Research Kit in March, which collects data from patients via the iPhone and is said to be a secure portal. People with certain conditions can opt in and participate in various clinical studies and surveys that can be evaluated and analyzed by medical researchers. They say the goal is to ultimately improve patients' health and the ability to care for them. While Research Kit initially launched with five app partners which collected data from conditions such as Parkinson's disease and asthma, it opened up the platform to developers and more researchers last month. But beware, ladies and gentlemen, I have a feeling that they could use that DNA data for more than just helping you cure ucky diseases. That data could be transmitted to the wrong people, so beware of privacy, ladies and gentlemen. Your life could depend on it, and that's why I've got the 5C, which has got the old-fashioned home button on it. I know, a bit nerdy, but at least they're not getting my DNA without my okay. Next up from Riot.com, this week marks the two-year anniversary since Cody Wilson, the inventor of the world's first 3D printable gun, received a letter from the State Department demanding that he take the blueprints down from the Internet. The alternative, facing possible prosecution for violating regulations that forbid the international export of unapproved arms. They're just plastic guns that you print in 3D. Big deal. Anyway, now Wilson is challenging that letter, and in doing so he's picking a fight that could pit proponents of gun control and defenders of free speech, here at SHR Media, against each other in an age when the line between a lethal weapon and a collection of bits is blurrier than ever before. Wilson's gun manufacturing advocacy group Defense Distributed, along with the gun rights group the Second Amendment Foundation, on Wednesday filed a lawsuit against the State Department and several of its officials, including Secretary of State John Kerry. In their complaint, they claimed the State Department agency, called the Directorate of Defense Trade Controls, violated their First Amendment right to free speech by telling Defense Distributed that it couldn't publish a 3D printable file for its one-shot plastic pistol known as the Liberator, along with a collection of other printable gun parts, on its website. And just in time for lunch from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. A barbecue restaurant in northern Colorado is being criticized for its plan to give white customers a 10% discount. The AP reports Edgar Antillon, owner of Rub and Butts Barbecue, there's a name for you, Woohoo! and Country Cafe in Milliken hung a sign reading White Appreciation Day June 11th, because all Americans should be celebrated. Antillon, who was born to Mexican parents, pointed to Black History Month and Hispanic Heritage Month. He tells KUSA TV in Denver he figured the least we could do is offer one day to appreciate white Americans. Ricardo Romero, a civil rights activist in northern Colorado, called the plan a perpetuation of racism. Jennifer McPherson with the Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies says people who believe they are discriminated against can file a complaint with the Civil Rights Division. You know what? If I were living in Colorado, I'd be taking my mom there for Mother's Day weekend. Honestly, I would. So, where can we turn for safety from digital spies? Why does the color of our skin still make the liberals' blood boil? And what's a good way to treat an aphid problem in my salmon bushes? Stay tuned for developments in our continuing battle against global socialism. Coming up after the break, you might want to learn from this guy who doesn't know how to aim pepper spray in Crime and Pinhead. In our Game Show News Minute, Neil Patrick Harris gets ready for the best time ever. And after hearing my collection of Mother's Day facts today, you will be hashtagging mind blown. That's all coming up on the SHR Weekender. I'm Corey Evans. We'll be right back. I'm Corey Evan from the Evan Miller Report. Each weeknight, I not only help Jay out in our continuing battle against global, global socialism, socialism and preside over lawsuits across America, but I also bring you the latest market numbers and what's going on in Hollywood, oh, Hollywood. In short, I'm just trying to tie it all together so Obama's minions don't rip it apart. Join me, Jason Miller, and Corey Evan for the Evan Miller Report weeknights at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on shrmedia.com. Also on the iHeartRadio app. 
by corrupt politicians. You got a business. That, you didn't build that. A team of ordinary men emerge from the ashes to give voice to the voiceless and hope to the hopeless. Sackhead Sean. Dude, I'm not saying calf is stupid pro. Sackhead Clint. All good friends of ours usually show, show up drunk. drunk. Also starring Sako as the producer. I'm a little bit drunk, I'm a little bit drunk, cause I'm drinking, drinking, drinking. They are the Sackheads Radio Show. Every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific on shrmedia.com. You're listening to the SHR Weekender on shrmedia.com. Once again, here's Corey. I thank you as always, Sackhead Sean. Sackhead Sean, one of the three Sackheads running the Sackheads radio show every Wednesday night at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, only on shrmedia.com. And Sackheads, I hope for your sake you all got your mom something good for this Mother's Day weekend. And I will be asking you about this later on, so don't think I'm kidding, guys. Never mind, it's time to find out who botched their crimes this week in Crime and Pinhead. Ah, yes, my favorite time of the week where we find out who did something so stupid in committing their crimes that it was only a matter of time before I reported on it. First up from the QC Times out of West Virginia, a beaver man is in jail after authorities say he foiled his own robbery by accidentally pepper spraying himself. The Register Herald reports 43-year-old Michael Kevin Meadows of Shady Spring was arrested Wednesday for attempted robbery. Authorities say the man went into a pharmacy in Beaver on Tuesday wearing a full camouflage and a paintball mask. The would-be robber started spraying pepper spray in an effort to take down employees, then walked into the cloud of pepper spray in front of him. Police say security footage showed he was affected by his own pepper spray. He staggered out of the business, got into a vehicle... Police investigating the incident discovered the name of the man who was driving the vehicle. The driver identified Meadows as the attempted robbery suspect. Woo! Somebody help me! Somebody help me! Yeah, I know, right, SpongeBob? And now from the Kentucky Independent, it's time for the Duct Tape Bandit. He's on his way to prison for a mugging he committed while on parole for the robbery that inspired his nickname. Casey Kazee, that's a name right there, was sentenced to 12 years for first-degree robbery Friday in a brief court appearance and then led back to the Boyd County Detention Center where he has been confined since his arrest in December. He'll have to spend at least 85% of that time behind bars before he's eligible for parole again, a requirement under state law for violent crimes. He'll also have to serve another two and a half years on his previous conviction because he was out of prison on probation when he committed the robbery. He pled guilty in April to assaulting and robbing Ashland businessman Marcus Woodward in an alley near 15th Street in December 2014. It was an earlier robbery that gained Kazee his notoriety and his nickname. In 07, he tried to hold up Shamrock Liquors on 13th Street with his face and head swathed in duct tape as a makeshift disguise. Kazee cemented his place in the annals of dim-witted criminals when, in a jailhouse TV interview, he struck gangster poses and proclaimed his innocence. Yeah, that's always a bad combo. That, like, Italian bread and bean and cheese burritos. And from the Pulitzer Prize winning Post and Courier, Protesting 101, How Not to Accomplish Your Goals. So Wednesday afternoon, a group of people decided to protest police brutality and racial profiling by blocking traffic on the Ravenel Bridge at rush hour. Some of these folks who were chanting Black Lives Matter refused to move when they were ordered off the bridge by police. They locked arms, holding PVC pipes, and eventually just sat down in the middle of the bridge. One of them even grabbed a detective by the arm. That was dumb on so many levels. But as columnist for the Post and Courier Brian Hicks says, the bigger problem here is trying to get a message out by inconveniencing other people. In fact, that's a great example of how not to get anything done despite the urging of the late civil rights leader Bayard Ruskin. And this article does go on for quite some time, so it too will go up on the SHR Weekender Facebook page for you to behold. And I hope you do. But at any rate, dumb criminals beware, I'm watching you. I'll see you next week in Crime and Pinhead. But of course, this weekend at the SHR Weekender, we are all about Mother's Day. This one's for all the moms out there, and those of you who actually appreciate your mothers. 
There are few things in this world beloved more than mom. This from Fox News. Moms are the embodiment of eternal love and devotion. Sick and need caring for? Mom's there with a bowl of chicken soup. Had your heart broken? She uses her sleeve to dry your tears. As inherently selfless creatures, you know that they deserve a day all to themselves. One that celebrates everything that they stand for. And since there were multiple milestones and holiday celebrations that evolved to make Mother's Day the extravagant it is today, this year you can impress Mom with more than just a bouquet of flowers. You can tell her one of these interesting facts that she probably didn't even know. It used to be called Mothering Sunday. That's number one right there. It didn't evolve until years later, but it was initially a Christian celebration called Mothering Sunday. It originated in the UK and parts of Europe. It fell on the fourth Sunday in Lent where parishioners would return to their mother church. Number two, after the death of Anne Reeves Jarvis in 1908, her daughter Anna Jarvis sought to host a celebration to thank mothers everywhere for all they do. She held the first Mother's Day celebration in a Methodist church in Grafton, West Virginia, with financial backing from Philly retailer John Wanamaker. Thousands also congregated in Philadelphia at a Wanamaker's retail store for a Mother's Day celebration of their very own. After Jarvis successfully held her first Mother's Day, she sought out to make it a national celebration. After years of lobbying, she finally got the attention of President Woodrow Wilson in 1914. He proclaimed that the second Sunday in May, no matter what the date, would belong to moms across the nation. Jarvis, though she founded the American modern concept of Mother's Day, remained unmarried and childless throughout her entire life, so there you are. Interesting concept from someone who didn't know what it was like to be a mother herself. It's amazing. Mom's value is, of course, priceless, but according to the National Retail Federation 2013 survey, consumers will spend an average of $168.94 on mom. She very well deserves it, ladies and gentlemen. I might not end up spending that much, but I would like to. No budget. And if you think giving birth after 40 is crazy, think about this one. Maria del Carmen Bosada de Lara, that's the name, is the oldest verified mother. She was 66 years old, 358 days, imagine that, just a week before her 67th birthday, when she gave birth to twins. She was 130 days older than Adriana Liescu, who gave birth in 2005, to a baby girl. In both cases, the children were conceived through IVF with donor eggs. That's according to Wikipedia right there, so... So you know, those mothers deserve all the loving care that Mother's Day could offer. But on the flip side of that coin, the youngest birth mothers in the world. There have been birth mothers reported like 10 years and under, but did you know that the youngest birth mother in the world was actually 5 years old? I know, not exactly the most pleasant thing to hear in the world, but I still felt it was worth pointing out. Lena Medina, a Peruvian woman who is the youngest confirmed mother in medical history, gave birth at age 5 years, 7 months, and 17 days. She lives in Lima, Peru. So you know the poor dear had quite the turmoil in her childhood. Medina has never revealed the father of the child nor the circumstances of her impregnation. Initially, the pregnancy was thought to be a tumor, but her doctors determined she was in her 7th month of pregnancy. She has had a second son since then, but obviously the first son still weighs on her because Gerardo Medina, her first son, died at age 40 in 1979, so if you know Miss Medina, give her some love. So remember, ladies and gentlemen, the mothers of the world are the ones that keep this world going, so you owe her big time. Do something nice for her. And I'll give you a few tips on how you can make Mother's Day the best one it can be this year in just a few moments. But first, we have to take a break. When we come back, Neil Patrick Harris is at the top of the list in my Game Show News Minute. And then some money-saving tips on how you can make the most of Mother's Day. I'm Corey Evan. We'll be right back. How you doing? John Grant here. When I'm not slaving over a hot microphone on the 405radio.com Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern, I check out Sean and Clint here at Sackheads Radio. We all appreciate the best political bloggers, writers, and commentators. We either get them on our shows or we make fun of them, as it should be. So check us out live Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern or forever on the podcasts on the 405radio.com. 
I'm Corey Evan, the Game Show Geek. It is Saturday, May 9th, 2015. Here's your Game Show News Minute. NBC has revealed the name of its upcoming variety show to be hosted by Neil Patrick Harris. The weekly extravaganza will be called Best Time Ever with Neil Patrick Harris. It'll be an hour long, debut this fall on NBC, and be based on the long-running successful British series Anton Deck's Saturday Night Takeaway. Let's hope we can take away something from Neil Patrick Harris's version. <laughs> Labor Games premiered on Wednesday night on TLC, but that debut elevated it to a near-historical status. Labor Games may be simultaneously the most brilliant and most head-shaking game show idea ever. It actually averaged 535 and a half thousand viewers over the hour-long premiere, which is a feat which has me floored. <laughs> And Nick Arcade's creators James Bathia and Karim Metef, along with the show's original host Phil Moore, have re-teamed for what they're calling a spiritual successor to Arcade. After reuniting last year at an event celebrating 90s Nickelodeon, the trio is taking the Kickstarter approach to funding Nth Level, a new elimination competition series that the guys hope oozes the DNA of the 1992 show. Details will be revealed as they become available, and I hope they do become available. I was a fan of the original, you know. Never mind, that is your Game Show News Minute for this Saturday, May 9th. Hope you have a great day. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? I actually watched the pilot for Nick Arcade, which was posted up on YouTube, and I was actually quite impressed with it. I mean, they may have used the set from Nickelodeon's Get the Picture for it, and it showed. But to see the very idea coming to fruition, I like the concept. And hopefully a lot of mothers watched along with the kids, just to understand what kids were into back then. Speaking of mothers, gents, kids, listen up. This week's tip of the week is for you. Now, earlier I mentioned that on average people spend 168 bucks and whatnot on their moms, but you don't have to spend quite that much, I think. You can actually scale it down in a few ways and make Mother's Day the best you can on a budget. Like, instead of buying gifts, whatever she wants, try to come up with an idea that you can actually make for her. Like if she's into arts and crafts, make her something arts and craftsy. And if you need a few pointers on how to do that, just ask me because I'm an artist. And I'll prove it. The second one is the restaurant. Ask her what her favorite place to eat out is and then take her there. Because oftentimes it's not as expensive as Red Lobster or the Olive Garden. Even if one of those are her favorite, just go ahead and take her there and, and look online for coupons. Like I previously mentioned for the fast food runs. Because they often work out for the bill at the Red Lobster as well. And most importantly, I think, the flowers. If you're one who grows your own flowers at home, bring her a bouquet of those. Because I think mothers everywhere can appreciate the effort that goes into planting a rose bush, growing it to adulthood, and then cutting the roses yourself, getting thorns in your fingers as you try to get the thorns off of them, and then putting them in a vase yourself and hand-delivering them personally. And, of course, if you don't have rose bushes growing in front of your home, just go to a local shop, and I'm sure that they will offer you some sort of low-price alternative. But no matter what you do, gents and kids, make Mother's Day the most that you can make it for your mom. It's very important, I think. And on that note, that is your SHR Weekender for this Saturday, May 9th, 2015. Thank you for listening. I'm Corey Evan. Follow us on Facebook.com forward slash SHR Weekender. Until next time, show your mother some love or not. The choice is yours. Thanks for listening to the SHR Weekend. For more information on today's program, go to shrmedia.com. Be sure to tune in next weekend.